Okay, I'm in Kosice, uh, Slovakia, and I'm in the East Slovak Museum. And you would think after visiting a lot of museums, I'd get super bored uh, with all of them, but it's, it's actually the opposite, because once you realize a couple of things, if you're in Europe, uh, a lot of these photos and replicas and um, almost anything really, uh, even pottery, uh, exists because somebody funded it. And so you can actually see history being told in every one of these photos. And it's not the thing itself that they're depicting that is relevant. It's the fact that if you see so many Catholic-based um, images, uh, what that tells you about history is that the Catholic Church was the one that was funding the art community, um, and in some cases, the, you know, even coins, uh, in order to establish its legitimacy. But it's the same thing that banks do today. It's the same thing that venture capitalists do today. And you can see, again, that all of this is designed to get out your own narrative, your own story. And this is kind of incredible. When you look at these books, you, you'll notice all of them are uh, published around the 1500s. And that's when the printing press became quite popular. Um, I don't know if, if it was Gutenberg. No, that may be the one we know about. And if you look over here, you'll see something really interesting. We all know about Martin Luther and in Germany. This is John Hus. I may not be pronouncing it correctly. I'd, I'd never heard the name until today. Um, and apparently he was in, uh, in Czechoslovakia and he was 100 years before Martin Luther. He was advocating reform. And so you can actually see that because so many of these works have been funded by the Catholic Church, you can actually see, you know, that it represented a core of power. And any time you have a core of power where you have too much of the same thing, it indicates that money is not being spent wisely, whether it's private or public. And again, at that time, uh, there wasn't really any separation of church and state. Again, when you see all the things in this museum, you can piece all of that together. What's really interesting about um, Jan Hus is that we, it's, it's, there are so many stories of reformers all over the world, but we don't know about them because we, have to, we haven't done a good job with translation. And so it's gonna, we are sort of in a world that has been globalized only for corporations and products, but not ideas. And the, and the primary difficulty with transporting ideas across borders is not only that people want to tell a story in the way that makes them look good, which in the case of the Catholic Church is really difficult, uh, given their own history, uh, going all the way back to Pope Urban II, uh, just going back to the consolidation of power, um, Spanish Inquisition, and of course, I believe that coin back there uh, commemorates the burning of the Czech reformer. And so it may not be who, who actually paved the way for Martin Luther. And this is really interesting. Look at Martin Luther. And you can see it's a small book, you know? It's, it's just fascinating to go back and see that, you know, small ideas and done precisely are oftentimes, you know, just uh, the force that changes the whole world. But it may not be that this book or this person, the person, the author, will be the one that changes the world. It may be that that person lays the groundwork for someone else that will later on become the preferred uh, messenger. But it all ties in together. And I think one of the problems we have uh, just in, in education is not understanding that almost everything in the world is incremental, uh, whether it's a person um, or whether it's um, uh, an idea. And part of that, if, if we understood that, we, wouldn't, we would try to create a system of knowledge that actually tries to capture every individual uh, rather than the whole. And especially with technology, it's not that difficult. I was downstairs and I have a, a kiosk. And uh, you know, the, in the kiosk, you can have multiple languages. There should be a time when we can have 100% of the languages translated, not just English um, and a few other ones that happen to be local. Um, because unless we do it that way, a different way, uh, we're still going to be provincial in a time when uh, corporations and products um, are no longer provincial at all. Um, and this is fascinating because um, I mean, it's just amazing. Even the chalice tells a story. Um, if you look at it, you can look at, you know, again, 1500. Um, you can see the, uh, even today, gold is valued uh, as, a, as a store of value. 
And that's what Bitcoin or stablecoin is supposed to be. It's supposed to replace gold as a store of value. And so you see all these things that are funded, um, a lot of them not only establish legitimacy, uh, but they're trying to create, uh, they're trying to pass on their own story. Every single thing represents the desire of whoever was in power at the time to tell their own version of the story. Um, and until we get a better translation system in place, and until we recognize that, you know, if everything has to be accessible to as many people as possible, because if you miss out on even one person, uh, that person could be an Alan Turing, it could be a Jan Hus, it could be a Martin Luther. Uh, and we don't know what happens when you remove uh, these incremental pieces from our lives. Uh, we don't know what happens to history.